morning, everyone, and thanks so much for attending today. My name is Nick Ettinger, and it's my privilege to be the moderator of today's panel, in which we're going to have a discussion about the directions for Canadian climate governance as we mark the launch of a new book entitled Reflections on Connecting Canada's Climate Policy Network. By way of introduction, I'm a geologist with a background in energy and historical climate change, as well as a soon-to-be lawyer finishing my articles at Tories LLP in our energy regulatory practice. I attended uh, law school at the University of Calgary, where I was fortunate to study with Dr. Fenner Stewart, one of the conveners of today's panel and co-editor of the book, uh, to which I also contributed a chapter focusing on the importance of climate policy today in view of the escalating climate crisis and potential backsliding international policy. In the spirit of reconciliation and recognizing that our panelists and audience are attending from across the country, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of Canada and acknowledge those ancestral holders and owners of the lands on which we are all situated. I'm specifically coming to you from Calgary today in the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also situated on the Métis homeland in the historic Northwest and home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I make these acknowledgements both in the interest of reconciliation, but also as a prelude to the discussion we're going to have today about the pivotal role that Canada's Indigenous peoples play in the direction and implementation of Canadian climate policy. So with that, I'd now like to introduce our panelists. As I mentioned, Dr. Fenner Stewart is an associate professor at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law and a co-editor of the book. His expertise lies in energy and environmental policy. Andrew Showalter is coordinator of Indigenous Initiatives and Reconciliation at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law. He's a pro bono, pro bono poverty lawyer and current LLM student at the University of Calgary, whose research is supported in part by funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Benjamin Dacus started with the C.D. Howe Institute in 2006 as a research fellow, taking on gradually more research roles including leading the energy environmental work at the Institute. From 2018 to 2019, he was the Director of Policy, Budget and Fiscal Planning for the Premier of Ontario, then returned to the C.D. Howe Institute to take on the role of Associate Vice President of Public Affairs. And lastly, Nancy Olaweiler is an economist and professor at the School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser University. Her current research focuses on policies to reduce GHG emissions and increase resilience to climate impacts. She has served on federal and provincial government advisory committees, and her current roles regarding climate change are as co-chair of BC's Climate Solutions Council and a member of two expert committees for Canadian Climate Institute. I'll now hand things over to Fenner for an introduction to the book and the purpose of today's panel. Thank you, Nick. Um, today is my honor to introduce um, a new book entitled Reflections on Connecting Canada's Climate Policy Network. A group of talented authors hailing from diverse backgrounds collaborated on this group effort. Janice Sara and I had the privilege of being its co-authors. Before discussing the book, let me extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed supporters. This project would not have been possible without the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, the University of Calgary Faculty of Law, the Canadian Climate Law Initiative at the Allard School of Law, the Commonwealth Climate Law Initiative at Oxford University, the Center for Business at Allard School of Law, and the Canadian Institute of Resources Law. This summer's extreme weather has underscored the harsh realities of climate change set to escalate in the coming years. To temper these impacts, swift societal change is imperative. Failing to act decisively now, we are bequeathing future generations to a devastated world. However, record-breaking global oil demand this year starkly reflects just how far we must go in a short time. Climate change transcends borders, demanding unified action. 
A prosperous nation, Canada is uniquely equipped to pioneer this challenge. Yet, to truly lead, Canadians must be better coordinated. Our book initiates a dialogue on improving this coordination by bridging gaps between public and private and by exploring innovative pathways for collaboration and change. The genesis of our book can be traced back to the Canada Climate Law Initiative Conference in 2001 entitled Connecting Canada's Climate Policy Network. The insights from this conference traced some of the contours of Canadian climate governance, providing the inspiration of our book. The book invites readers to delve into further research on climate policy coordination. It represents a start to charting the layers of Canada's climate policy landscape, hinting at the formidable alignment efforts required for meaningful change. Each chapter serves as a rallying call to find new opportunities to enhance institutional thickness within Canadian climate governance. In facing the daunting challenges posed, time is of the essence. This prompts the question, what governance initiatives would best um, expedite effective climate action in Canada today? This question is crucial and sets the stage for my co-panelist discussion facilitated by Nick. Before concluding, I will briefly touch upon um, each of the three panel topics. Andrew leads the first discussion, emphasizing the need for more Indigenous settler engagement on climate issues. He discusses the standards for meaningful engagement and the diversity and distinction among Indigenous cultures and ethics. Next, Ben addresses the important role of private investment in climate action, cautioning that investors may be reluctant to invest if they fear a new federal government might rescind GHG pricing legislation. He delves into the how private contracting and international trade agreements can shield national pricing from this political volatility, thus providing the investor protection that can pave the way for greater support for climate initiatives. Lastly, Nancy tackles the question, why is it so difficult for actors from civil society and government to coordinate on climate policy? After outlining the potential obstacles, she poses various mechanisms and partnerships that could facilitate better coordination. Each presentation offers a unique perspective into the challenges and potential directions for Canadian climate policy. We hope you find the discussion enriching. Now I'll hand the reins back to Nick to moderate the panel. Thank you for participating in this important dialogue. Thanks very much, Fenner. So Andrew, I'd like to turn to you first. Uh, as a lawyer, Métis, and legal scholar focusing on Indigenous settler relations, can you please elaborate on the significance of Indigenous settler engagement in the context of climate policy? Uh, Tanse, Andrew Nesigason. Uh, I'm Andrew Showalter. Uh, I'm Métis and a citizen of the Métis Nation of Alberta. And uh, Nick, thank you for your question, and, and thank you as well uh Fenner for the invitation to speak to this question and join this uh esteemed group of panelists today uh of which I hope to learn a lot a lot from today um I thought I'd answer that question um by about some of the themes surrounding this idea of if I can use the language of of indigenizing is that's it's quite a loaded word um but really bringing meaningful inclusion and consideration of indigenous tradition, law, ethics, and ways of knowing into climate policy in this nation based on, of course, my worldview as a Métis person who's on a journey of self-rediscovery and reclaiming what was lost from colonialism, um, and based on my experiences as, as a lawyer, uh, coordinator at the Faculty of Law, and uh, my current work as, as an LLM student. So I thought I would focus on, on two main themes. Uh, the first is, is this idea of meaningful engagement. Um, what does that mean for Indigenous people, uh, communities, and organizations to be meaningfully engaged versus uh, merely included or frankly exploited? Uh, we can look to the very recent history for some, some examples of Indigenous communities being entirely left out, um, or if we think of instances of negotiation where 
there's a constitutional obligation uh, to consult Indigenous people, how that has failed, how that has not been inclusive, um, or how it's been equivalent to, you know, mere note taking uh, versus very meaningful two way dialogue that could result in inclusion of Indigenous values um, or accommodation for whatever the negotiation is speaking to. Um, the other theme is this uh, idea of indigenizing Canada's climate network is, is it's not a one size fits all approach. Um, and the reason for that as well, there may be a number of, of similarities between indigenous nations and cultures where there can be overlapping policies that, that make sense. Indigenous nations are going to be diverse and distinct from one another. Um, you know, this can be informed by traditional stories, teachings, and ceremonies that have been passed down through generations, the traditional legal systems, and constitutions that have been shaped by the land that have continued to exist and evolve in the face of colonial power structures and, uh, and the changing uh, environment and ecosystem. And of course, these things are relevant when we consider what treaties and agreements exist um, between sovereign nations. You know, we may have historic treaties. Uh, in certain areas, modern treaties or comprehensive land claim agreements, self-government agreements. Um, and of course, we have to consider the diverse kinship or governing structures within these communities themselves and the roles that individuals or uh, different structures within that system play uh, when we think about pol uh, policy. Um, so there, there's a lot there's a lot to unpack there. I've, I've admittedly left a lot out, but um, these two very broad themes kind of set the stage for what policy thinkers uh, need to consider. Um, the big question I think that is steering the, the conversation is how do we bring cultural values that inform Indigenous management of the environment? And, you know, management isn't really the appropriate word um, because, and, you know, I encourage you to read the two chapters on, uh, or pardon me, read the, the chapter on bridging Can Canadian climate governance to Indigenous ethics in this book, because there's very powerful demonstration of these values. That is being a part of nature and understanding the responsibility that we have as Indigenous people, the reciprocity and understanding that, you know, we're not above, we are not in control um, of the environment. We're not, um, we're we're not, uh, we're a part of the relationship. We are part of the environment, which of course, when we consider climate change um, impacts everything as we can see from um, the emerging crisis um, that seems to, we seem to get news of every day, but whether that be animals, plants, rocks, waters, or the air that we breathe. So to bridge these two themes, and have a meaningful inclusion of Indigenous ethics means uh, we have to deconstruct um, the traditional colonial narrative and take a step back from, from what's been dominant. And one of the ways I think we have to do that is where we have touch points of engagement between Indigenous communities and government or proponents or, or third parties. Um, maybe I'll use the example of where there is this constitutional obligation uh, to consult, you know, what we have is a is a clashing of worldviews, um, but frankly, we have to we have to do better than just having this turn to a clash of worldviews. We have to provide the platform and capability of Indigenous people to speak to these issues. Um, you know, many Indigenous peoples and communities and nations are being pulled in multiple direct directions to consult when we think about uh, the obligation to consult. Um, but can use assistance with the capacity to participate meaningfully uh, to really get their values out there. So that could be, for example, it could be financial. Um, it could be considering what platform the negotiation is. So, you know, what Western format are you meeting and how are you considering evidence? What kind of things are you, are you looking at when you consider um when you consider policy decisions related to the environment. It could be offering assistance for certain studies to be conducted or information sharing that could really, that Indigenous nations could utilize in preparing their own um, analysis or submissions. Um, having a seat at the table is one thing, but reciprocating that recognition of the knowledge and responsibility that um, these Indigenous communities have to and, and Indigenous negotiators have to their community, their cultures, their place in their society 
their values and their worldview is really crucial to pushing the envelope past mere inclusion. Um, another is to look what we're all already doing. Um, you know, there are examples across Turtle Island of Indigenous peoples utilizing their laws and rights, um, rights to use the language that's been placed upon many of our traditional ways where we have responded to the climate emergency. So whether that be species rehabilitation uh, with animals by not hunting or carving out specific areas of traditional territory where activities have been conducted to suspend to help rehabilitate areas or lands. Um, you know, maybe it's it's planting a species of plants where they've tra traditionally been located that have been removed by erosion due to increased rainfall, entering sacred treaties with other nations and species themselves. Um, you know, the language and attention to climate policy is something that we've always had to consider. The ecosystem has provided and shaped our understandings, and this understanding has solidified itself in our sacred systems, stories, and traditions, and that reciprocity we have to fulfill is through responsibility that our actions ensure that the future generations um, can continue. And so this is the knowledge that that we can bring in. And, and on that note, I notice I've, I've hit my time, so I will leave it there uh, for now. But miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, that was wonderful. Uh, you know, talking about the clash of worldviews and coming to a nation to nation basis for consulting uh, really brought to mind for me the Yahi decision of the BC Supreme Court in which the court found that uh, the cumulative impact of uh, industrial development had infringed the treaty rights of Blueberry River First Nation. Um, and unfortunately, it took a momentous trial to really get to the point where Blueberry River was having a significant input into the regulations for the management of the land. Um, and, and your words really reminded for me that learning from that is that we need to do uh, that sort of consultation and reciprocity on a much more proactive basis and involve Indigenous peoples and regulation and decision making a lot earlier. So thank you, Andrew. Uh, I'd like to next turn to, turn to Ben Dacus. Um, ben, given your ex expertise at the C.D. Howe Institute, uh, which really lies at the nexus of public economic policy and politics, can you please share your perspectives on the role of private investment in climate action and the potential obstacles to such investment? Well, looking forward to it, and I'm very humbled uh, to be on this panel. And the, the group who authored the book is really the who's who in climate policy. So uh, my contribution is going to be very modest uh, compared to what they've done. So Fenner, that's my way to plug the book for you. Uh, everyone go read it. Uh, so my starting point is that private investment is going to be the critical component of addressing climate change, whether it's carbon capture and sequestration, Hydrogen, electricity investment, et cetera, all, the, all those things are going to be needed in huge quantities, and private investors are going to need to be behind it. Now, the carbon price uh, or any kind of carbon price is going to be the stick uh, that makes these investments, and the subsidies are the carrot. But investors are going to hedge their bets, and they're not going to fully invest in emissions reducing, reducing technology if they don't believe that greenhouse gas pricing in particular, and subsidies to, uh, I guess, an extent, are going to withstand changes in governments. So what's needed is a form of governance, both with the private sector directly using uh, contract references and internationally uh, using trade deals that provide enforceable penalties on government policy and government policy changes. So these tools are going to provide that certainty for investors. And I've got some tangible examples uh, of how this matters in the real world, given some uh, firsthand experience I have uh, in dealing with both of these issues uh, from inside government. So to start with the story time, I'm thinking that since it's summer, I'll start my remarks with a story about beer. Uh, and you'll see very soon why this is relevant. Now, anyone here from Ontario, like I said, I can't see you, so I don't see your hands. Or if you've ever come to Ontario uh, to buy a beer uh, at the beer store, you'll know that the, the system, and again, in technical economics terms, is bonkers. Uh, that's, that's how we describe it. It's a private quasi-monopoly. I'm not allowed to use the cartel word. Uh, uh, protected uh, by the government. So here's why this is relevant. So when I was in the Ontario government, uh, the government was committed to do everything it pretty much could uh, to eliminate the beer stores monopoly on selling beer directly to consumers. There was a commitment uh, to put beer and wine sales into grocery stores and, and convenience stores. Uh, 
But there was a problem. The previous government had signed a contract with the beer store's owners to keep that system in place until 2025. And these owners were mostly in the United States and some uh, from Europe. So the government uh, passed legislation canceling the contract uh, to open up the market, but it never actually put it into force. Uh, technically, uh, again, that's uh, the technically not proclaiming it into force because the risk of an investor state dispute uh, coming under what was the NAFTA was going to be enormous. And the fiscal cost of a, estimated to be about a billion dollars in terms of damages that uh, would go to the owners of these companies from proclaiming this policy into force would have been fiscally ruinous and go to uh, huge corporations. So the government just really could not politically afford uh, to make that kind of uh, make that kind of policy. So what's the link to climate policy? And it said any government can in theory pass legislation that kills existing policy, whether it's a beer store contract, electricity contracts, carbon capture and, and sequestration credits, electric vehicle subsidies, and of course, uh, greenhouse gas uh, pricing. So what we really need to think about are the governance and institutions that are gonna make them think really hard uh, and think twice about canceling policies that will help support climate action. And we all know that uh, the federal Tories are gonna wanna, uh, if, they ever, if they take government, they're gonna wanna take uh, actions to stop uh, or, or eliminate carbon pricing. So what are the things that we can think about? What kind of governance institutions can we think about uh, to make it harder for future change? Now I'll, I'll get into these in more detail. The first is contract for differences. And the second is an investor state dispute mechanisms. So the idea of a contract for difference is a government-backed contract that guarantees companies the equivalent value of their investment for a future carbon price. Now, Blake Schaefer, uh, who many of you are going to know, uh, described this as the horcrux of climate policy. Now, my wife told me that I've just offended every single true Harry Potter fan, as I never actually read the Harry Potter books where this idea comes from, but I'll power through uh, anyway. And so, so for those who don't know the world of Hogwarts, uh, the idea of the Horcrux is to spread out something uh, you don't want put back together again. Uh, but for this to really work, it's kind of really hard to find. The Harry Potter kids, you know, took a lot, made a lot of effort to, to, to put all, uh, or you know, the books were a lot, of, you know, there was a lot of effort in terms of keeping this, uh, keeping this apart. We need to replicate that in terms of um, the, uh, how we think, think this through. Uh, is we can't just uh, invest this in government where our government can both decide at the same time that we're gonna, is going to eliminate carbon pricing and contracts for differences. Uh, we need to create an incentive where businesses in the financial services sector has a bottom line incentive to keep contracts for differences in place. And that's gonna create a network of powerful business actors that's gonna to wanna to keep carbon pricing going. So I'm, I'm happy to get into that in a lot more detail uh, in, in a Q and A. The second tool that is very powerful is contracts, for, is, is, I'm sorry, investor state dispute mechanisms. And the idea is that in international trade agreements, if a government policy changes rules in such a way to effectively, like, effectively act like expropriation, companies can seek compensation uh, at a, a trade uh, dispute mechanism. So I've offended the Harry Potter fans uh, already, so I probably offended the trade lawyers with that summary, but I think you, you kind of get the point of uh, the investment state, uh, investor state speed mechanism. And this has already proven important for climate policy. Uh, again, going back to the Ontario example, it canceled a, what was called the White Pines Wind Power Plant uh, in Prince Edward County. It, this was owned by a German company and it got compensated. That company got compensated for uh, the cancellation. And part of the reason uh, for that uh, cancellation, uh, for that uh, that reimbursement, was the existence of an investment state dispute, investor state dispute mechanism between Canada uh, and and the European Union. So we need policies like that. We've got it with CETA. Uh, we have it with uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership, but we lost it, and with the move from NAFTA uh, to the, to Kuzma. So coming back to this idea and ways to include it in our climate governance is going to be key. I'll end one, one last note, which is that's just the governance. At the end of the day, public opinion is gonna really matter. Uh, one of the things that happened during the pandemic was that the um, restaurants were being absolutely demolished in terms of their, uh, their viability. So what the government did uh, is allowed restaurants uh, to 
um, send alcohol along with their along with their food delivery, food delivery orders. What happened then is that the definition of restaurants became very elastic, and it was pretty obviously um, in uh, in violation. Of what 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 governments what the government allowed was in violation of the beer store contract. But would the beer store and their owners have uh, politically survived being seen to be fighting struggling restaurants in the midst of the pandemic? When you can get public opinion uh, sufficiently behind these policies, that, that alone will be um, difficult for, for a government to reverse. So we may see this kind of public support for electric vehicles, um, electric vehicle subsidies in, in say southwestern Ontario. But what will will this uh, political support survive uh, for for climate policy? Because remember, if, if something is truly unpopular, like some of the green energy policies in Ontario uh, that we saw, uh, where we saw cancellations go through, regardless of the fiscal cost, governments will, will still bear the costs no matter what if they're truly committed to achieving that. So we'll leave it at that and look forward to hearing more. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate the analog to the beer store, uh, which I admit I was personally victimized by during my time in Kingston at Queen's University. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Nancy Oldweiler. Nancy, with your extensive experience in the School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser, uh, the BC's Climate Solutions Council, and the Canadian Climate Institute, can you please provide your perspectives on the challenges faced by civil society and government actors in coordinating efforts on climate policy? Additionally, what measures, in your view, can be taken to enhance this coordination? Thanks very much, Nick, and thank you, Fenner, for the book and inviting me to this esteemed panel where I don't think I have any Harry Potter stories and, and nothing tops the beer store in terms of bad policy. But I'll, I'll talk a bit about the challenges and then also what I think are the directions that are currently underway that can be enhanced. So as the book clearly demonstrates in many of his chapters, there isn't an integrated network ad addressing climate governance in this, in this country. There are many, many organizations working on climate policy, both in civil society, at all levels of government, but they tend to be siloed and often siloed by discipline. You can see here, we've got a, a range of disciplines and that doesn't even account for the scientists involved in the essential work on understanding climate change and uh, what to do about it, the engineers and everyone else. So, you know, we, we are sitting in, a, in an environment where I think at least all of us that are on this webinar say this is a huge complex problem and we've got lots of people working on it, but are they working together enough to move us forward fast enough? And I think one of the things I want to emphasize is the need for speed. Uh, I don't want to sit here and tell you climate disaster stories, but things are happening faster than we thought they would be happening. And yet there is still time if we get our acts together. So what are some of the challenges? You've already heard some of the solutions from Andrew and Ben, but what are the challenges? First off, as I've already noted, the silos. We are working in silos, we are not coordinating. And part of that, none of this is, is deliberate. It's that we're all busy people. We feel comfortable with the people we know how to work with, but we've got to find ways to overcome some of that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, we're dealing with complex issues. This is not something simple. I mean, nothing is in public policy, but some are easier to handle. I mean, I once did a, a, okay, Ben, I'll tell you the story about dog walking parks, off leash dog parks. You know, the problem doesn't get any easier than that. Should you let dogs run wild in parks? The amount of time spent at local governments dealing with that problems is inordinate compared to the severity of the problem. So we're dealing with something much, much more serious. We're also dealing with old agreements and decisions that have been made at a different time with different objectives before climate rose to the, one of the top levels of the policy agenda. And I'm talking about things like the government buying their Trans-Canada pipeline, which a recent article about the gift it's giving to the province of Alberta. Uh, there's things like in my province, I'm from British Columbia, 
uh, the contract with LNG Canada, which gave them all kinds of concessions. So one of the things we have to do is unravel or figure out how to unravel some of these old agreements. And as Ben clearly pointed out, this comes with consequences called compensation. So going forward, we need to address some of these things before we can go forward. For all of you in the room that are constitutional people, the constitution, federal provincial powers. Uh, as we know, when the, or when the federal government brought in the carbon price, the uh, backstop that was challenged in through the legal system by three provinces, the federal government's position was upheld. It was uh, in terms of peace order and good governance and within the federal powers. But we're always dealing with the tensions between the Fed and the Prov. Uh, hostile voices and misinformation. You know, the naysayers, I think we've moved on a bit from people that say climate change isn't real, it's a hoax, it's just weather, to people saying, yeah, no, there's too many parts of the country on fire, underwater, et cetera, to continue that. But now you get arguments like, well, it's just too expensive. We can't, we, we can't deal with it. it it's going to cost too much in terms of the economy. So you've got that kind of information. And finally, as Andrew pointed out, we are living in a colonized environment where we have not heard the voices of indigenous people. We have tended to focus on economic outcomes for the short term rather than cultural values, long term, local and indigenous knowledge. So these are all some of the challenges and barriers. Okay, what to do? Number one, and this may seem self-serving from an, from an academic. Research is vital. I'm not suggesting in any way that any of the research groups that are organized not continue their pathway. That is absolutely fundamental. It is important to show the value and the efficacy, the effectiveness of policies, and also to speak out. And here's something I think we should, we're, we're doing, but we should do more of, speak out against those untruths speak out against the misinformation, provide counterexamples from our own research and our endeavors to say, look, that is simply not the case, and then come up with innovative solutions. So as I alluded to a few minutes ago, one of the arguments is, well, it's just too expensive. We can't force people to buy heat pumps. We can't force people to get off natural gas because what are the low income people are going to do? Well, we've had 100 years of public policy to tell you what you do when you've got a situation where a group in society is disadvantaged. We have other policies that we can use to affect those, whether there are supports, whether there are things that like Ben is talking about, low income loans, interest free loans. That sounded a lot better when interest rates were zero than they do when they're 5%, but they're not 15 or 20% like they were in the 1980s. So we know how to handle things. In BC, we have a, a, a GST-like rebate for low-income and rural people. We've got to get those numbers up. Most of those people are not being unduly affected by the, climate, uh, by the carbon price. So leadership, responsiveness, use your research to, to go back. And the final, one of the final things I'll talk about is, is accountability. So as, as uh, Nick mentioned, I'm co-chair of what's called the Climate Solutions Council, which is a legislative body in British Columbia. We are uh, broadly representative of different sectors, academia, the business sectors, including the carbon intensive ones, uh, our indigenous communities, local governments, uh, young people, labor unions, et cetera. And we have to report on the government's progress to targets. So we write an annual report. We also write lots of letters saying, do this, do that. But we are an accountability entity. Uh, we don't do our own primary research. We depend on your organizations, what you're doing in these various research groups to come up with things. But it's a mechanism by which publicly issued, here's, here's how well you're doing or not doing. So accountability, second form of accountability is in the form of legislation and rulemaking. So Ben had two great examples, contract for differences. That does at least two, if not three things. One, it reduces the risk to investment in climate friendly 
activities. Number two, it holds governments accountable. So looking for ways to hold governments accountable, whether it's through specific policies, whether it's through legislation, or whether it's through the formation of bodies, uh, advisory bodies, accountability bodies that can uh, continue. And they have to be continuing. We all know about auditor generals and we did have a commissioner for the environment that produces reports, but they have to be public and visible. We've also got to get in, uh, as, as Andrew has said, meaningful engagement. And not just because we're legally bound to do it, because that is knowledge that is important to looking for solutions. So there is hope, but we don't have a lot of time. And so anything we can do in our own organizations, in our own think tanks, in our own roles to provide that kind of both leadership, uh, partnerships with financial sectors <clears throat> and, and get the accountability and get the, you know, and get the messages out there uh, is I think our obligation. So thank you and look forward to the questions. Wonderful, thanks so much, Nancy. So we do have a few questions uh, and one I'll begin with, which seems to be addressed to a couple of things touched on by both Ben and Nancy. Um, given the fact that, you know, there is the risk of repealing certain climate related legislation, such as the carbon price. Um, and given the fact that we have elected officials who are responsible for legislating and making sure that we have um, things that are going to continue and, and be in place such that we can be accountable to our climate policy initiatives. What can the academic uh, portion of the climate policy network and the public policy portion of that network do to increase awareness amongst the public who elect officials who will eventually be legislating these things that will entrench um, further core cruxes, if you will, of climate policy such that we can ensure that the risk of repealing and the risk of deviating from those pieces of legislation going forward are less. So maybe, maybe I'll just uh, give you a few thoughts. First of all, a network like this is just critical for, as, as Nancy uh, said, uh, getting the information out there, telling the world about, um, about the importance of climate action, um, and at the end of the day, that will you know, public opinion will determine uh, where governments go. Governments are, have one job, one job only, and it's to get elected. And if they were reflect, reflecting where the public goes, that's where they'll go. Uh, the, you know, that, that was my, my last point, which is that uh, even if something is is so unpopular, is so popular, uh, you know, and, you know the governments aren't, aren't going to get they're going to get rid of it. So. The network is really is really important here. Um, in, in terms of other policies, in terms of uh, preventing backsliding or, or action now, my one my one note of caution is to is be realistic about uh, what the public will accept as well. Because I don't want I don't want to see so much action, so much ambition that a large chunk of the population doesn't see themselves as, as uh, in the in the future. Uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a low carbon future. I'm worried about uh, where the public, of, you know, the people in Alberta are gonna go, where a huge chunk of, uh, of the workforce that sees themselves as their identity tied with the oil and gas sector. I worry about uh, too much action too soon without a real policy in place in terms of what's gonna to happen to the, these, these folks and what they want to happen, um, and ending up uh, having a lot of unintended consequences. I'll just jump in and add, augment what, what Ben has already said. I mean, number one is to get, as I was talking about, get out there with information. Here's what carbon pricing is doing. And to offset any of the misstatements or fuzzy statements that are made by political parties to gain votes amongst their base, because you're not going to change the, the hardcore base on, on any side. What you're going for to inform people are the people that have an open mind and are going to listen and you know be uh, informed by information and knowledge. That's step number one, as Ben has said. Step number two 
is hold the whoever is making these comments accountable. If you remove one policy, what are you going to replace it with? And how do you know that is going to work? So for the example given, uh, the Federal Conservative Party, well, we're just going to put in standards. Uh, I'd like to give you some little history on how long it takes to put in a standard. The uh, Ontario government said they were going to regulate back in the old days when we were just worried about ordinary pollution, like, you know, effluents flowing into the Great Lakes. They put in a program called the Municipal Industrial Strategy for Abatement. It took 10 years to 11 years to design these standards. By the time they came into place, they were obsolete. So there's a bit of history that you can draw out and say, what are you going to do? Are you gonna stand up and say, I am not gonna address climate change. I'm only gonna leave it up to the provinces to address climate change. Well, you know, so hold them accountable. That's, that's number two. And I'll tell you just one story in BC, the current government is an NDP government. Uh, the government that brought in our carbon pricing, we were the first ones to have a, a big carbon price. Quebec had a little carbon price ahead of British Columbia, it was brought in by a conservative government, Premier Gordon Campbell. The NDP ran against it called the Axe to Tax campaign. They lost and they lost big. They lost most of their seats. So beware. Don't assume that if somebody opposes it, that there will always be, you know, people glomming on saying, oh, God, the stupid carbon tax. Hold them accountable. Offset their misinformation with, with our work and the work of others. Thanks, Nancy. That's really valuable perspective and history um, with respect to, to the risk of any backsliding. Uh, we have a couple more questions from the audience um, really geared towards Canada's role internationally. Uh, the first one, I'll open it to any of the panelists who would like to weigh in. Um, and that is given the U EU trends um, in terms of being ahead of Canada in climate policy and regulation, what can Canada learn from the EU climate policy networks? Um, and just as a, a little anecdote, I'll, I'll mention to the audience that just prior to launching the panel today, we were discussing uh, the potential of a carbon border adjustment mechanism in Canada, which of course the EU has implemented and is on its way uh, to really having it in force. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll open it up to the rest of the panel for any comments. Ben, I went first. Why don't you, oh, ben, ben, you're on. No, I was to say I went first last time, so I'm not going to go first next time. Uh, uh, this the question of carbon border adjustments is a really important one to, to wrap to wrap our heads around. We in Canada uh, have a very unique spot in this, given that we'll have we have, we'll have close trade relations with the EU, but also with the United States. And when you really step back and think about our our, our fundamental trade relationship, that with the United States is going to matter. That just as much, if not more, than anywhere else. Uh, so, how are we going to, uh, in our negotiations with, as a part of Kuzma or wherever that goes, integrate border carbon adjustments when they don't have a carbon price? They don't have an explicit carbon price. How are we going to reconcile uh, our position vis a vis the EU versus the United States? This is a really tricky question, uh, but it's a really important one for us to, to wrap our heads around. I was just going to add that um, if we're not on top of this, we will be behind it. Sounds pretty obvious. And it, it will hurt us. So, you know, uh, the power of border adjustments or restrictions on trade. Uh, again, here's a historical example. Uh, old growth harvesting of timber. There was a company in British Columbia called Macmillan Bloedel. And it ceased harvesting old growth forest when European buyers say, we're not buying any more of your product. So that is always a caution out there that uh, any one of our trading partners can restrict the import of our goods. So integrating, as Ben has said, is really important. But the, 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 the real 
issue is now the United States. And given the political uncertainty there and the potential for completely craziness on all fronts, uh, if it wasn't crazy enough to begin with, it could get worse, is, is something I think is very daunting for this country. And it's not one that we can solve in the next 15 minutes, let alone years. So stay tuned. I think it'll be very challenging for us to put border adjustments on vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. And Ben and I could go back and forth on this, but it, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna be really challenging. If, if on the positive side, the Inflation Reduction Act has spurned massive amounts of investment in the U.S. on energy, on, you know, fossil fuel substitution. I mean, it is a huge subsidy program, and it's also spilled over into the border for Canada. And in, you've, if you followed the the battery uh, production story, which which Ben will probably be writing about along with the beer store. You know, we're giving huge subsidies to car manufacturers, but it does stimulate it on the other side too. Um, and again, final comment is it's sometimes not that easy to get rid of things, even if you have a government hostile to climate policy. Uh, so have faith, have hope, keep working. Thanks, Nancy. I'll just add also one uh, sort of flip perspective as we uh, we're talking about the EU. You know, there's also the geopolitical risk, and that comes with the risk of backsliding climate policy. And with the breakout of the war in Russia, we saw really the, the ramifications of some poor climate and energy policy on the part of a number of countries in the EU who had invested so heavily in Russian energy. And as a result of the war, we're investing hugely in natural gas, LNG, and even coal. And so notwithstanding the strength and resilience of investment in renewables and how much of their uh, electricity portion that that is consuming now, there is still this huge risk that of all this investment in natural gas now, and even coal is gonna result in stranded assets and is gonna prolong the EU's transition away from fossil fuels. And so that's another thing that Canada needs to be uh, really aware of is going forward is our energy security is, is not just a climate issue, but it's a geopolitical issue. Uh, and so I'll move over to another sort of internationally focused question, um, which is the question is how can the governments of wealthy countries, uh, which I'll rephrase to say under the UNFCCC um, Annex One countries, for example, how can those countries use some of their largesse to reward those who help them achieve their policy goals? Well, I, Ben said he wouldn't go first, so I have to go first. Uh, we already do, we just don't do enough. Uh, two things, give them money and buy their goods. Short and sweet, love it. Fenner, I saw you were about to uh, comment as well. I was, I was about to say something quite similar to that. That's right, those are the key ways that you would reward countries. Of course, there's new mechanisms being um, developed that our richer countries have to support at, through the United Nations um, for adaptation and resilience in particular for, for countries. And I think that uh, um, supporting the mechanisms that are being developed through uh, through international mechanisms is is an, is an important first step. Um, I guess if, to go back to the other question for a second, um, in terms of Europe, I think that um, Nick, you correctly said that you know Europe has some uh, initiatives that are models, um, but I, it's important to underpin that there's not a lot of really great models for climate action. We are largely failing and to give a perspective that there are countries that are doing really well. In particular, Canada has been flagged as having an inadequate response to its policies, which are themselves inadequate to meet the standards if the goal was 2050 or 2060 at this point. But um, yeah, I think that modeling after Europe might be good in particular ways. I think that they have better information sharing uh, throughout the EU, especially considering you're looking at sovereign nations that are doing so. 
Um, uh, but I think there's a lot more that can be done. And I just jump in because Fenner made me go back and reflect uh, the whole issue of uh, offsets. So credits for, and this is what Fenner was uh, talking about. This is something we need to do a better job on both designing and understanding. It is a mechanism by which we can, if done well, uh, lead to a lower cost of achieving climate targets by having the most efficient, best uh, actions to take, you know, either have the carbon not go into the atmosphere or take it out of the atmosphere. So um, our governments, all of them, well, I'm speaking for my government and the federal government, uh, there's what counts under the Paris Agreement. And we've said those are things we're gonna do, but we don't have yet a, a well-defined, clear offset policy, both for domestic offsets and international offsets. And this is really crucial. So again, you know, asking people to work on this from all of the disciplines' points of view, economics, law, it's you know, science, et cetera. I mean, we, we were hopeful that we could be selling offsets in terms of uh, sequestration. So, uh, you know, forests, plants, et cetera. Well, now with uh, whatever the size of the, the burning forests in Canada and the United States are, that is, you know, becoming challenged. So, what is it out there that that we can do, and what can be done in countries that are verifiable? So that sort of goes both to your question, Nick, and the question about internationally, but also domestically. It's a huge issue, and more needs to be done on it. Agreed. Um, and you know, with respect to sequestration, not with respect to forests, but on carbon capture and storage and direct air capture. Um, just coming back to the question about what wealthy countries can do to uh, reward those countries or uh, annex two or non annex one countries who are, you know, gonna not be on the bleeding edge of um, addressing climate change. One thing that comes to mind to me is that we don't really lower the economics and the expense of uh, carbon capture and storage, which may be necessary uh, given where we're at right now with our climate targets, um, which is also a precondition to ever being able to do direct air capture on an economic scale. If you know the, the wealthy countries aren't willing to invest in that and, and take the expense of doing so now, uh, the non or, or the developing countries who are going to be using uh, more fossil fuel based forms of energy for the foreseeable future, if they don't have the ability to use carbon capture and storage going forward, um, then that's a huge problem. And so that exporting of, of technology is going to be another huge uh, way that Annex One countries, wealthy countries can contribute going forward. I, I think that also just in terms of not only carbon capture, but all technologies or alternative products, wealthy countries like Canada have to be the market labs for their development, their refinement, to reduce the green premium on these products, because if they can't work and be competitive in a country like Canada, it's hard to expect that they could be integrated into the markets of most of the globe's populations that can't afford to pay the premium to live the lifestyle they want to now. So if, if we can't transfer to say electric cars as just a, a symbol or a metaphor or an example, uh, if you can't do it in Canada, it's not going to happen in Mexico, right? Because the premium to do so is too high. So if you can't find ways to bring the cost of the technology down and to create mechanisms and subsidies that work, it, it, those sorts of technologies are not going to be available for economic reasons to most of the world's population. And, and that's where the change is really going to happen. So I think that citizens of, as consumers in Canada have to really buy into a lot of these technologies to refine them, to make them work here so that they become more effective, efficient, cheaper products to be able to export to the rest of the world. Yeah, and, and this uh, triggers a response to one of the questions that, that's 
in the chat, which is our greatest resource in Canada isn't the oil, isn't natural gas, it isn't the critical minerals uh, in, let's say, Northern Ontario. It's the people. It is all the people who, uh, especially, you know, I think of the ones in Alberta, who are all of a sudden going to become easy experts in carbon capture and sequestration because uh, it's a it's a pretty similar process to taking it taking oil out of the ground. The the skills that we can enable, and people forget about this. The the leader in terms of per capita innovation um, isn't Ottawa. Uh, it isn't it isn't uh, Waterloo. When you look at patents, it's Calgary. Uh, Calgary is the leader in terms of in terms of uh, innovation uh, among at least domestically applied pat uh, patents. That is our, our true our true advantage you know, globally, and we can we can really uh, leverage that uh, going forward. So uh, that's why I'm very optimistic about the role of Canada, the role that Canada can play, even though our emissions are are on a per capita basis uh, quite high. Uh, we have a lot to provide to the world in terms of uh, the way that we can reduce our emissions, but apply that globally. Well said, Ben. Uh, so cognizant of the fact that we're coming up uh, on the hour here, uh, I'm going to wrap things up, and I just want to thank. First of all, the audience, uh, so much for attending today. Uh, we really appreciate you listening and uh, please do read the book um, and it's free and, and virtually available. Uh, and second, thank you so much to all of our panelists, Fenner, Nancy, Ben, and Andrew. Thanks for your time and sharing your perspectives today.